The NBA playoffs are now in full swing, the focus shifting between the Miami Heat's attempt at a three-peat and the lifetime ban imposed on L.A. Clippers owner Donald Sterling. But behind the scenes, there's something going on that the average fan never sees, a revolution of sorts, a growing army of math nerds analyzing all kinds of data that more and more impact which players are drafted, which free agents signed, and how teams actually play the game. What began with Oakland A's general manager Billy Bean and Moneyball more than a decade ago has now become the rule in almost every sport. An invasion of numbers men who see baseball, basketball, soccer, and hockey not so much as games, but as problems to be solved. It's a Friday night in April and the Houston Rockets are home against the Oklahoma City Thunder as both teams drive toward the playoffs. On the court, the Rockets stars are lighting up the scoreboard. Often in a nondescript room under the stands, there's another Rockets team that may be nearly as important. It's team of data analysts, assigned to scrutinize and dissect every play. Their boss is Rockets general manager and chief geek, Daryl Morey. Think of one jump shot and think of if you could quantify everything. Did the ball go in because he's a good shooter? Did he go in because a good pick was set? Did it go in because the pass to him was good? Did it go in because the defense was bad? Did it go in because where he was on the floor and how comfortable? There's like a hundred factors that go into one jump shot going in or not going in. And this team's job is to find all of them, then use them to enlighten players like emerging star Chandler Parsons. Daryl Morey is very into that, and so he'll show me all these numbers of where I shoot the ball good on the floor, where my low percentages are on the floor, and in the back of my mind, I'm always using that during a game to, to not get to those spots or to get to my hot spots. The data show that a three-pointer from the corner is pro basketball's most efficient shot, so the Rockets fire up a flurry of those. The numbers say mid-range jump shots are the least effective, so they want to avoid them. As far as the data, is it being used quarter by quarter, game by game? How is sure. it being implemented? With the coaching staff, yeah, we have information provided generally at halftime. Um, that's when you can take a, you can look at it, take a step back, you know, analyze it, change what you're going to say to the team at halftime, and do it to help make those real-time decisions. The Rockets and every other NBA team have a powerful new tool to deliver more and better data. So, Brian, sport view camera. Yes. That's this is, it? This is it right here. Holy That's cow. That's the camera. That tiny camera is at the heart of a system called sport view, and Brian Kopp convinced the NBA to install it in every arena this season. His company, Stats, has long been the leader in providing mountains of data for all sports. The developers that founded SportView is an Israeli company, and they worked in the Israeli Defense Forces on missile tracking technology. Instead of tracking missiles, the six SportView cameras mounted in the rafters track every movement of every player on the court, plus the ball, and feed all that information, nearly a million data points for every game, into computers for processing by complex algorithms. So now for every shot, you don't just know there was a shot. You know where he was, where the closest defender was, how many dribbles he took before he did it, how far he ran before he took the shot. The, the way you can use the data to analyze it is almost limitless. For those of us that weren't great in math, you're, you're basically talking about how fast LeBron James gets from point A to point B. Yeah, yeah. And then what happens when he gets to B. Right, right. And it's everything before A, during A to B, and after B. And not just LeBron, but all the other players in the court. Cop says the ability to track every player's every move yields crucial insight into individual and team performance. Do you look at the data sometimes and say, oh, no wonder they're winning? The San Antonio Spurs. Uh, we looked at data during their winning streak, and the way they pass the ball and the number of players they get involved in the offense is so much higher than anybody else. They have more players averaging 40 touches per game than any other team by far. I'm sure if you sat down with Greg Popovich, he would say, I knew that without these crazy cameras. A lot of people knew that, but they didn't know the data behind it, or they didn't know the extent of it, and they didn't know the gap between what they were doing and everybody else in the league. With all the analytics and the numbers and the data now, you get a pretty good idea who, who guys are, and uh, there's, no, there's no hiding. 35-year-old Miami Heat veteran Shane Battier is arguably the NBA's best-known numbers man. 
His love of advanced metrics, particularly the tendencies of his opponent, has produced a career far longer and more lucrative than his physical gifts might predict. It seems like you play the odds as efficiently as possible. Every player, good, bad, ugly, indifferent, has a strength and a weakness. When I came in the league 13 years ago, uh, scouting reports consist consisted of the old eyeball test, and it was usually a page long. Yeah. And it said, you know, jo Joe Smith likes to go left. Well, great. How often does he go left? How good is he going left? Oh, he just likes to go left. Nowadays, they'll say, well, Joe likes to go left 70% uh, of the time. But you know what? He's 10% less efficient going to his left. So even though he likes to go left, he's not as good going to his left. Now, when he goes right uh, and shoots a layup, he is top five in the league. So that's the worst case scenario. Never let Joe Smith drive right, make a layup, because he's going to beat you. Before Battier helped the Miami Heat win the last two NBA championships, he played for the Houston Rockets, and Daryl Morey was his GM. It was a perfect pairing. A player who loved numbers and a GM with a computer science degree from Northwestern who was trying to start a data revolution in the NBA. Coaches always knew that a guy like Shane Battier was pretty good. They just couldn't like point to anything and say why. They could just say, hey, I know. And it turned out they were right. When you did the analysis, guys like Shane were, were way more valuable than people thought. If you could point to one or two things with Shane that were the, the difference makers with him, what would they be? Coaches look for guys who can be in the right spots on defense, who uh, only take high quality shots. Battier open and hits a three. They tip the rebound to their teammate versus being the one who gets it for sure. Those kinds of players coaches have always valued, uh, but they didn't have a way to like point to a number. Now there's numbers that say those guys are good. More than any other general manager, Maury uses those numbers to construct his team. He was able to steal Chandler Parsons with the 38th pick of the 2011 draft because he had the data on his versatility as a college player. But his advanced metrics aren't foolproof. That same year, Morey had guard Jeremy Lin in training camp and let him go. So on one end, we have the Chandler Parsons story. And on the other end, we have the Jeremy Lin story. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, one is a eureka moment. One is what, the oops? Uh, yeah, there's a little oops there. Uh, I shouldn't have cut him. After Morey cut Lin, then watched him become a sensation with the Knicks, he had to spend $25 million to get him back as a free agent. But it turned out once we got him in our system and tracking him, he, he was one of the highest accelerating players we've, we've ever seen. Maury says Lynn's acceleration, measured by the data team on every play, creates scoring opportunities for himself or his teammates. Another piece of data led to the blockbuster trade that brought all-star guard James Harden to the Rockets last season. I'd say his number one skill that makes him unique, really through the history of the NBA, is his ability to drive to the basket and either put it in, <laughs> which is an undervalued skill, or go to the free throw line, which is also undervalued. So to talk geek, I mean, he's yeah. like three to four standard deviations out of the norm in his ability to drive to the basket. Even if he does it at two standard deviations, you're, you're way ahead of the game. If you haven't heard sports guys wax poetic about standard deviations, Odds are you haven't attended the annual sports analytics conference put on by MIT Sloan School of Management. Hey, jump. This is where you see that math majors really can't jump. Where grad students present research papers on rebounds and ball screens. The first step is data segmentation. Where data guru Nate Silver, whose 538 blog correctly called every state in the 2012 presidential election, rolled out his new blog for his new employer, ESPN. People want to say like, oh, here are these magic nerds with their formulas. It's like, no, we're just about better decision making at the end of the day. Where one of the best attended panels focused on analytical advances in sports betting. I am a first year student here at MIT Sloan and a degenerate gambler, so I'm pretty excited. Okay, come on in. Yeah. Yeah. And where hundreds of computer science and statistics majors line up for five minute job interviews with the Rams, the Bills, the Cavaliers, and the Nets. Nice to meet you. Well, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thanks. Congratulations, Thanks. guys. Daryl Morey and Jessica Gelman co-founded the Sloan Conference seven years ago after teaching a course together at MIT. She's an executive on the business side of the company that owns the New England Patriots. 
So how many people showed up at the first conference? About so about a little over 100. Yeah, yeah about 125. And I would say about half of them were our friends. And we're like, please come. <laughs> By 2014, even a huge convention center in downtown Boston couldn't hold all the people who wanted to attend. We had uh, 2,000 attendees at this year's conference. Uh, we, had, we sold out two months before the conference. One panel featured Phil Jackson, holder of 13 NBA championship rings, and now president of the New York Knicks. Indianapolis Colts quarterback Andrew Luck spoke at another. Adam Silver, the new commissioner of the NBA, at another. Still, not everyone at the analytics conference was buying into the new numbers game. This is former NBA coach Stan Van Gundy. I don't want to offend anybody, but one of the problems is there's a lot of people in a lot of organizations who don't know the game, who all they know is analytics, and as a result, that's what they rely on, and they use that to supersede what guys like us see with our eyes, and I think that's a major mistake. As if to prove Van Gundy's point, the data built Houston Rockets lost in the first round of this year's playoffs. And even the biggest fans of analytics acknowledge there are things coaches see, like team chemistry, that don't show up in the data. How big is the divide right now, the data divide between coaches and, and, and stats? It's, it's still there. Um, I think it's narrowing by the day. We're never going to take away from the great coaches and the decisions they make. You're never going to have analysis that allows you to go out by itself and win a championship. It's going to be one of the factors that go into it. But I think we're gone of the days of, at least in the NBA, teams not looking at information. A simple example is the sport view feature that shows teams just how far their players run. I also read he's, he's run 130 miles over the course of the season. Of what possible use is that be? <laughs> Turns out there's a crucial use. So from the beginning of the season to the end, what was the output, what was the load on that player's body? And this is per minute. And what this is showing you is the beginning of the season, this player was above average. But to us, a red flag is look at the end of the season. The last seven, eight games are below average. In this case, it's a valuable player on a playoff team. So if I'm a coach and I say, I show this to this player, what's up? I could say simply, are you tired? Yeah. What's yeah, up? It's going to be one of the things that they do to say, hey, based on this data, we're measuring something that's below average. What might be going on? What's going on is the measurement of player performance is becoming more personal and precise by the day. Given the rise of something called wearable tech, the biggest buzzwords at the analytics event. All the sensors are built into the garment itself. Yeah, right. In wearable tech, sensors are sewn or inserted into jerseys to measure everything from heart rate to acceleration to what coaches call work rate, a player's exertion. Many NBA and NFL teams are already using such systems to track players' performance in practice. Shane Battier says it's only the beginning. The wearable tech. Yeah. Um, What's your thoughts on that? <laughs> Big Brother's watching. Yeah, Big brother. that's, well, it's, I was uh, headed in that direction. It's, 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 it's yeah. Everyone is eventually going to have a, a, a chip on their on their jerseys at some point. Uh, you believe that's coming to the league? I believe that's coming. One we're working with is actually a patch, a wearable patch that you would wear 24/7, and what that's collecting is your heart rate, your body temperature, how well you slept last night. All of that is geared towards your readiness and your recovery because that's what everybody's gearing towards. It's all about winning games. It's all about get, making sure you're in the right position to perform. Well, but it's not all about winning games either, though, Brian. It's also about invading someone's space, so to speak. How much resistance are you getting to this sort of brave new world technology? Well, it's, it's early. We're going to follow behind what the, what the teams and the leagues want to do. And, and they're, they're going to be the ones that determine that use of data. Uh, in a sense, we're just facilitators. There's talk about you know, monitoring sleep, body chemistry, and things like that. Is mm -hmm. that too much Big Brother, or is that just on its way? It depends on uh, how much of an edge you can create by, by gaining the data on those things. Um, now, when you start to wear a chip in the bedroom, uh, that's where I draw the line. I love my job, but let's, let's leave it outside the bedroom. Yeah. <laughs> he probably shouldn't laugh because the drive for more and better data shows no signs of stopping. Like it or not, the bond between the nerds 
and the jocks adds up. Oh, Patio is cooking tonight. 